Designer joins us for part two of bringing birds and bees back into your garden. But that's, you know, that's the cultural paradigm for this country. Everybody aspires to this. What I'm going to say is terribly radical because I'm going to suggest that um, you um, eschew the pesticides and, and learn how to tolerate a few weeds, you know, just for the sake of diversity. Um, I'll show you something else here. Um, like this lawn, <coughs> it's a turkey on there. This lawn is about 50% grass and all the rest of it is, um, let's see, it's got clover, chickweed, sink foil, heal all, lots of violets, which are the larval food plant for the fritillaries. Um, it's still not something that would support neotropical migrants. It wouldn't support little, you know, warblers and vireos and flycatchers, but it's better than, it's better than, it'll support other, other birds. And this uh, gets mowed periodically, not too often. Those are turkey poults that are getting crickets off of it. Um, so it will, it, it is useful for some ground dwelling birds, but not really for uh, migrants in the grass, which you have to cut because it's very allergenic. So that does get cut. You can use other ground covers if you're in the shade. This looks impossible to attain, but um, this was a cornfield 60 years ago, and it was allowed to go to uh, turn into woods. And trillions seed themselves in. They, they get, the ants carry the seeds around and, and they spread. So it's, it's not impossible to think about a ground cover in a shady place. It doesn't have to be that big, but you can do a ground cover of trilliums or other things. Uh, New, this is not New York fern, this is something else, but New York fern makes a really good ground cover and it turns gold in the fall. Uh, these are just annual plants that provide seeds for some common birds. Um, perennial bee balm, which is a little bit better. These are unbothered by bugs, but good, good uh, nectar producers for hummingbirds. I'm just going to scoop through these. These, um, <coughs> these so-called purple comb flowers are, uh, if you're not too uh, fastidious about removing the the, the, uh, the comb, if you leave that on there, uh, the goldfinches nest very late in the summer and they love those seeds. So that's a, something that you could leave as part of the habitat. I put this in because I want you to know that I am not uh, a, a Nazi. <laughs> I'm not a native plant Nazi. And I do have my weaknesses, and I love roses, and I can't grow hybrid teas here. I just forget about it. Um, but one thing you can grow in this rainforest climate is uh, species roses and old-fashioned shrub roses. Yeah. And um, these will bloom for like six or eight weeks. They'll fill your yard with fragrance, but I look for also for wildlife value. And as habitat value, I have found thrasher nests and um, catbird nests and song sparrows will nest in these rose bushes. So I plant these around my, around my vegetable garden and that's my non-native indulgence. <laughs> so what can you, if you have one of these yards where you've just got some um, foundation plantings and, and uh, a lawn and a tree in the middle of the lawn with a circle of mulch around it <laughs> and a single specimen tree with a circle of mulch around it, you can make this into a better habitat and you can make it a more interesting place for yourself. Start planting some native shrubs around the outside. Um, just around the periphery, shrink your lawn more and more so that you know you get more interest over the over the course of the summer. Even if you're just here for the summer, you, you get interest um, in flowers, early flowers or fall colors later on. You can plant um, small shrubs around that tree uh, mm. just to um, 
give a little bit more vertical uh, diversity to your yard. This one's a uh, yellow poplar with, uh, as you might suspect, a native azalea planted at the base. You can even plant, if you don't have any big trees um, around, it, it, you know, in a woodlot next to you or your natives, um, you can plant big trees. This was a, this was a magnolia macrophylla, which is not really native to right here, but it's close. And my son gave this to my husband for uh, Father's Day, um, 10 years before that was taken. The plant is now about 30 feet tall. Uh, they grow really fast, so big trees will grow fast. Um, this has not been photoshopped. That, that flower is bigger than my head. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. It smells good, too. Is there a common name for them? Big, big, big Leaf Magnolia. Big, 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 big. This is something that looks like something from the Pleistocene. You'd yeah. expect to see a dinosaur come <laughs> marching out from behind it. It's a very spectacular tree. I invite you all to look at ours along our small garden walk next to our house. We have three different types of magnolia big leaf varieties. Yeah. Well, I want to wind up with just um, a sort of a, not a collage, but a, a series of, I started out by telling you we are kind of the epicenter for biological diversity in the East. And so if you were looking to plant, and I'm trying to tell you to plant native plants for native birds, and um, if you're looking to um, just add to the interest and diversity of your property or your yard, there's so many things that you can choose from. And I'm not saying you should have them all, but the more the merrier. <laughs> and this is a puny picture of a, of a service, service berry. It gets pretty flowers in April. It gets um, little edible berries, but the birds will beat you to it um, they, in June. They sometimes call these June berries. Um, it gets edible berries that the uh, wood thrushes just love. Mm -hmm. And then it gets good fall color. Uh, the pink shell azalea blooms the end of April, early May. If you're not here to see those beautiful blooms, uh, maybe you come up on weekends or if you're here all the time. But even if you don't see the blooms, you can uh, put them in your hedgerow or something because the uh, fall color is just a beautiful burgundy color. Good foliage all summer long. Everybody plants uh, dogwood. You, you, don't, you can't find a better tree for form and beauty. Mostly planted for the flowers, but it's the, the little berries on that are really good wildlife food. And, um, Kusa dogwood does not substitute. It's, it's beautiful in its own right, but it's not a substitute, as far as wildlife is concerned, it's not a substitute for, um, for the uh, native dogwood. So this is my <laughs> house, um, and it really is a hillbilly cabin. <laughs> what they call cabins around here is something else, but this really is a four-room hillbilly cabin that my husband built. <laughs> And uh, that's pinkster, uh, pinkster flower. We rescued that from the dump. It, um, it, that was 20 years ago, and it's turned into the most beautiful fragrant flowers. They're butterfly magnets, they're hummingbird magnets, uh, and it just fills your whole yard with fragrance. Um, this vine growing along here is the native coral honeysuckle, but it also comes in a gold color. And the uh, hummingbirds don't mind the gold color either. This is my bedroom up there to the to the right, and um, uh, I can sit my coffee in bed and watch the hummingbirds come and and visit that vine. And that's a Catawba rhododendron down there that was fished out of the Colasage River that it had washed out of somebody's landscape. <laughs> and Jeffrey rescued it and planted it also about 20 years ago. Crab apple is, uh, the native crabs are fragrant and beautiful and, and plant one of those. Uh, this is a fuzzy picture of a yellow wood. You don't see a whole lot of yellow wood around, but they do get clusters that look like, like wisteria, clusters of fragrant white flowers. Is it a vine or is it a tree? It's a tree. <coughs> okay, I've seen it and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, it gets good fall color, yellow fall color. This is a better picture of 
what those uh, flower clusters look like. It took a long time for it to bloom for me. I gotta confess on that one. Um, one thing that grows here on this is a fringe tree. Uh, I'm just trying to give you suggestions for, you know, pick any one or two or three or five. Fringe tree grows right here. It's very hardy. I've seen it growing out of the, a split in the granite on White Rock Mountain. So, you know, it'll grow here. It'll get bigger than a dogwood or about the same size as a good sized dogwood. Fragrant clusters of white flowers. Great plant. Good fall color. Uh, what can I say about the lame azalea? This is one that blooms a month earlier. It blooms in May, a month earlier than all the others. <coughs> that, um, I think it's a tetraploid because it never gets seed. I never see any seed on it, but it's a pretty spectacular thing to stick in your landscape. And if you've ever looked closely at the, um, the mountain laurel, they're amazing. The, <laughs> they've got this, I gotta talk about this, I gotta talk about sex here. The, um, you see those little bumps on the corolla? The anthers are tucked into those little bumps. And when a bee uh, goes in and starts rummaging around in the flower, those anthers spring up and bop him on the back <laughs> and sprinkle pollen all over him. And then he flies to another flower and um, starts looking for nectar and that pollen gets on the stigma and so the, it gets cross-pollinated. So that's all I'm going to say about plant sex. <laughs> cross-pollination. <coughs> And this was supposed to be about bees too, wasn't it? <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want to lay too much on you, but you know the bees are the honeybees are having a real bad problem too. <laughs> You're probably aware of that. This is just another um, selection of uh, of our native um, mountain laurel, Catawba rhododendron. Blueberries are the most underused native plant. They are they have beautiful little flowers that look like lily of the valley they get fruits that you can eat if the birds don't get to them first and beautiful fall color um, mm -hmm. they turn How much sun bright red uh, i usually plant them like around the edges they do very well around where they get a little bit of sun and a little bit of shade but i think they'll tolerate full sun Okay. Up here, full sun. up right here, full it. sun, <coughs> as long as they get enough water, which is certainly not a, not a big problem this year. Not a <laughs> this is not a very well-known tree. It's called the bottle brush buckeye, mm -hmm. uh, native. Uh, these these flower clusters are buzzing with critters, with insects, but they're up there. They don't bother you, and. I know I'm talking too much, but I, I do want to make this point. We've been sort of brainwashed to think that every bug is a bad bug. You know, there's just a very small number of bugs that are actually bad, that, that actually make trouble. And 99 and 9 tenths percent of all the insects in the world are, start thinking of them as bird food. <laughs> And, you know, so just uh, don't feel like we have to kill everything just because because it's a bug. <laughs> and if it chews a hole in something, well, that's okay. If it's killing your plant, then you want to do something about it. But, you know, I think we've just got to learn how to tolerate some of these things that aren't really going to kill us. They're, they're just doing their thing. Uh, this is a native azalea, a native, uh, um, Hydrangea, I think it's every bit as pretty as end of summer. I mean, en endless summer. <laughs> I call endless summer end of summer because sometimes it dies back to the ground and it's not until you don't get flowers until the end of the summer. And this is a hardy native that blooms in July. And this is not in the trade. This is one that Jeff and Jody found hanging off of a bank when the road grader went by, and uh, it's a double beautiful silver underneath the leaves. Stay tuned for part three coming up next.